but unfortunately, I won't get to do it till next time. There'll be another part. It's just so much is happening that one has to stay with it. It's very exciting to me. I don't know about you. I think you're all on the same page. Amen. And since um, we are pretty much on the same page, it's good to have a look at this. Amen? Okay. So, uh, we go back to our chart that we've been kind of summarizing with, and we see how we've seen how this beast of uh, Revelation 13 and Daniel and so many other places, uh, seven, Revelation 17, we see how it's emerging in our day and how the seventh head is about to form, okay? Uh, it's essentially Rome that has come back to life. It's the Roman Empire that was uh, scattered, actually uh, fell apart and was scattered. It's interesting that Rome scattered Israel and then God scattered Rome, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really something. So always remember as we go through these things that God has the last word and he works all things after the counsel of his will. Amen. We're going to start with that. We're going to end with that. Uh, just a little story on that. Uh, on the way into the Forum in Rome, uh, the ancient place where all the ruins are now, it's, it's a fabulous place to see, actually, if you're a history person, especially if you understand your Bible. Um, and in the way in, there's an arch called Titus Arch. And how many of you know who Titus was? He is the Roman general who destroyed Jerusalem and uh, scattered the Jewish people. And this arch was in honor of Titus who, who um, did this and took care of the Jewish problem, you know, and uh, they took care of the Jews. And uh, so on the arch, you can see the, pr the procession with them carrying all the, the objects from the temple, the menorah and all, and on the arch, you can see that. And um, also, it's right by the Colosseum. And the Colosseum and the Roman arch were both built with the money that they got from the looting of the temple in Jerusalem, the money they got from Jerusalem. So it was built on that, and all the blood that was shed and everything else. All the blood that was shed in the Colosseum is beyond description. But that's not the end of the story. Lo and behold, Rome, Rome fell apart and um, was scattered, and, and Titus and all those guys died. But as Israel have came back to the land, brought back by the Lord, and now as they're preparing to build the temple, they found on the arch a picture of the menorah, which they wouldn't have been able to reconstruct without that picture. <laughs> so God's using the arch to rebuild the temple. How about that? That's a pretty good story. So God has control, amen? And he works all things after the counsel of his will. So we've seen that the seventh head is forming, and... The mystery is that it, it, it used to exist, it existed, but it died and came back to life. That's the mystery. And we've seen how it has seven heads, and that one is the last one that's forming. That's the Roman Empire coming back together again. And we also have seen how it has ten horns, right? And the whole point that inspired this uh, teaching was uh, the development of those, the appearance of those ten horns again in Europe, and I think it really, um, I, I, I think it has advanced the whole agenda uh, another step forward, and it's amazing, really, how it has just uh, flashed before us again, so the ten horns can pop out anytime they want to accomplish uh, what their goal and plan is. Okay? So, we have seen how Europe is coming back, we've seen how they're trying to uh, work in the union of the Mediterranean and the neighborhood policy to bring all of the nations that used to be part of the Roman Empire back together Amen. into treaties and agreements and hopefully uh, some kind of EU membership. Okay? And now we have just, Israel has just um, agreed with, um, signed a treaty with um, Israel, with um, Italy and Greece and, and uh, Cyprus on a pipeline that's coming out of the coast off of Israel and going to bring gas, natural gas, to Europe. It's an incredible project 
they have found, Israel has found these incredible amounts of natural gas and, and uh, there's oil and all kinds of stuff. And of course, the world wants that. And this is going to put Israel in an incredibly strong position. And of course, uh, a connection to Europe that's not only going to be political, but it's already physical. As you can see, the placement of Israel, its closest uh, neighborhood, is, is the Mediterranean and Europe, right? Are you with me? Yes. yes. There's somebody out there? Wave. Hey, there you go. Okay, and we've seen how um, Mr. Macron just uh, decided to put together this uh, coalition uh, in, um, of ten nations to be the, the military arm of the EU. Uh, not just the, the whole EU is developing militarily, but this is the arm that's going to reach out and do the things that they want to do, and it just so happens to be ten nations, right? In keeping with the scriptures. Um, this is all recap, okay? We're recapping and summarizing what we have gone through already, and those are the nations there. And notice the, the agenda that they've written down for this group. Uh, the, in order to be a member, um, it ha the nation has to be in compatibility with the EU and NATO. A uh, common vision regarding security concerns. They have to have the ability to deploy liaison officers' long-term efforts in defense. So in other words, they have to be what they determine mature enough to be part of this group. They even use that word, which is astonishing, really. But they mean mature militarily and in, in their uh, vision, so to speak, that they will stand with. So this is the core, the inner core of Europe. A commitment to European security operations, an ability to deploy effective capabilities. In other words, when needed, they can be called on, right? So let's settle this thing once and for all. Uh, there's not a Mideast beast or any of that. This is, this is Rome coming back together, and it's very, very clear. And how anyone can uh, deny it is, is crazy, really. Okay, so in our new chart that we have... We have been able to fill in two things in the year 2017, 2018. And of course, there was the declaration regarding Jerusalem belonging to the Jewish people from a, uh, one of the most powerful nations in the earth. A big, 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 big step. Okay? Are they all opposing it? Uh, mostly, yes. But the fact is that a secular nation a powerful nation, a superpower, if you would, uh, has made this proclamation to move the embassy is historic and it has changed the whole situation in the Middle East. Yeah. And that is a marker. So we put it down. It goes down on our chart along with uh, the UN partition plan, the Balfour Declaration. Amen? So... Now we see the ten horns emerge in the same year, again. So it's another prophetic sign. And we can put it on the chart because it's not going away. Amen? Now the players, there might be one or two changes in the players, but there's always going to be ten that emerge to do the EU's bidding whenever they need something done. So they want a fast and effective force that can, they can deploy when they want to do something. Because these nations do have, they have an agenda. All right. Uh, so we have now seen that the next thing on the agenda really is, the next thing that's needed on our chart for it to be completed is the temple. That's the next piece that's needed. In fact, that's the only piece that's needed. We can boil it down to that. Everything else has been done. Isn't that amazing? In a hundred years, it's all been done, right? Actually, 120 years, all right? So if we're right, and we're not prepared to die for this, but there is um, incredible evidence here to suggest that we are in the last of the last phase, all right? Um, so... 
we may be looking at a 20-year marker here. And uh, I think there's a huge amount of evidence to suggest otherwise. In fact, uh, this whole chart would is just so clear what God has done that it would be it would change the whole picture if that didn't happen. I think it doesn't have to. God could pull do something else, but I think it's pretty clear that we're at the very end of the end. Okay. All right, so we don't want to set dates, but we're throwing out the year 2037 as a possibility for uh, the anointing of the holy place by the Messiah. Since, uh, since we have just had the declaration, now if they would just move forward and build the temple, then we get to the last phase. Are you out there? So I believe that this whole thing is that this phase that we're in now this decree that's come out, this whole Trump era, if you would, how long it lasts, I think it'll go the full seven or eight years. Uh, it's really seven years because, uh, you know, the last part you don't get to do a lot. Well, you can, but it's an eight-year period. But anyway, we're looking at seven years of a window. And after that, I think the, the other seven is not good. It goes south, I think, and we'll deal with that next week. I just lost my uh, screen, and so did you. Okay, this happened last last week too, around the same time. So we have to solve that problem, don't we, John? I think it's the distance, maybe. Anyway, whatever it is, uh, is it back? Okay, good. All right, sorry about that. Um, now. Let's go on now. Uh, we see there uh, Trump and Cyrus have been compared, and the Temple uh, Institute that has prepared all the vessels and, and the altar and everything to uh, restore the Temple, they have made a coin to commemorate Trump's uh, uh, proclamation. Isn't that something? And he's on the coin with Cyrus, King Cyrus. All right, um, so what, let's look at the 20-year lag thing, which we've been, uh, over the years we've talked about. Everybody remembers me talking about that. So let's look at it. Um, okay, 20 years. There seems to be a 20-year difference between, there seems to be a 20-year difference between when the, uh, people come back to the land and when the temple is uh, restored, okay? Um, 606 B.C., the first exiles were taken. That's when Daniel was taken. The, he, uh, Nebuchadnezzar came and took some of the nobles, some of the royals, and some of the priests and so on down to, uh, to Babylon, and he put uh, Zedekiah in charge, Right? As king, and you know the story how Zedekiah rebelled, and then in 586 BC, he came and destroyed the temple and took the whole nation captive, right? Uh, so that's a 20 year lag from the first exiles being taken and then this, the temple being destroyed. See that? Uh, 536, when the first the exiles came back to rebuild the temple, it, there was 20 years till 516 excuse me, before the temple was built. All right? So we see some kind of pattern here, don't we? Uh, 1948, the, the nation was restored in 1947, 48. 20 years later, 1967, they're reunited with the holy place. So that's a consistent pattern throughout thousands of years. The people... Uh, the city, then the holy place. So the people get restored, then the holy place is 20 years later. So if that pattern continues, there's a proclamation regarding the city. It could very well be 20 years. Cycle again. You see that? All right. So it's all about the temple, except there's one big problem. Uh, the dome and the rock sits right on top of where the temple is supposed to be. That is the holy place. It's the highest point in the mountain. 
the rock, the bedrock, is right underneath uh, the, uh, it was in the Holy of Holies. And it's right inside the Dome of the Rock with a big thing around it. And uh, it's the only bedrock on the whole place that's visible. And it's very clear that that was the place, okay? Plus, uh, there's actually the mark, you can see the markings where the wall of the temple was. And you can see uh, the, the size of the, the exact dimensions of the holy place. And you can also see the spot where the Ark of the Covenant was because it actually measures exactly the square that's in the middle of the rock measures exactly the measurements of the Ark of the Covenant. And people are trying to say that it's other places, but they're wrong, absolutely wrong. The scholarship on this is, is pretty good that this is the place because if you look at the walls of the temple, the foundations, they can see, I'm sorry, the, the walls of the, of the, the whole area here, the, the retaining wall around the Temple Mount area they can see the layers, the Herodian period, and they can see uh, the period from the Hasmoneans and so on. So they have, the evidence is abundantly clear. Because we have a guy going around now trying to say that it, it was down lower and all this. Well, it wasn't. This is the place. Okay? So maybe you see we have a problem. But God likes problems, doesn't he? God likes to solve problems. Amen? You with me out there? You say amen? Do we have to like take a lesson for saying amen or something? Just say amen. I like that. Okay. Now, um, what's happening now? Well, that's not my chart, actually. That's a newspaper clipping. It looks like there is a war coming. It will take a war or something monumental to solve this problem. Okay? Many of you agree. Um, so it looks like we might be getting just that. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to what this war is about that looks like it's coming. So that's what we want to talk about today. Okay? And this is another development over the last couple of years that is stunning. Absolutely stunning. I don't know if you've been noticing it. Uh, so we're reading here from Ezekiel chapter 38. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh. Now Gog is the prince, he's not the nation, okay? But he's prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. I will turn you about and put hooks in your jaws, and it will bring you out uh, in all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords. Uh, now, of course, uh, biblical times, they, you know, that's, that would be the, the way they would have been armed, okay? But today, they don't carry swords and so on. But... Uh, the prophets wouldn't be able to describe modern armor, so the point is they're, they're telling us that this is a great army, right? That's the point. Um, now, uh, he says that uh, he lists the people, Persia, Ethiopia, put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer with all his troops, Beth Torgama from the remote parts of the north with all his troops, many peoples with you. Right? Now it goes on to say, if you've read those chapters 38 and 39, it goes on to say how the reason they are brought up, uh, they're looking for spoil and so on. And it says that uh, there's a massive battle and the Lord just destroys them on the mountains of Israel. And uh, it's phenomenal. Okay? And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But let's just identify the nations around um, that are being spoken about in this prophecy. All right? Uh, we see Magog, Gog and Magog, or actually Magog, is everybody agrees. This is an ancient map from, I think it was 1874, um, that Magog is Russia, uh, that we see here Gomer and Torgama are Turkey, 
uh, Meshek and Tubal, again, the whole Russia, and uh, some of these countries that are a part of the old Soviet Union, those Islamic countries there. And um, so this is an older map, but I'm going to give you a few maps because there, there's some uh, debate about uh, perhaps uh, a couple of these, uh, a small debate really, it's not significant. Just about everybody agrees on where the uh, Magog, Gog, uh, Magog is, and Persia can't be argued with. There's a few little disputes, but by and large, there's also great agreement. So we're looking at the chart here. Again, we see Rosh, we see Magog, uh, Rosh being Russia, Magog, it's the same territory. So obviously, when you put the two together, it's, it's Russia, right? Uh, we see uh, Turkey, we see Persia, which today is Iran, and um, Put, uh, and Libya, and the area today, which would be Ethiopia is much smaller today, so it's actually Somalia and Sudan, places like that. Okay, uh, let's look at it again. It's the Sudan now. Um, Somalia is down in here. So again, this is another chart from somebody else. You see how I'm pointing out there's great agreement, right? Um, now, by the way, Libya uh, is in the news. You know all the stuff that went on in Libya the last uh, 10 years, right? 2011, remember the Arab Spring, which kind of went right across this area and deposed Gaddafi, and Israel, the situation in Libya has changed. So actually put, and Kush really is what it says. It doesn't really say Ethiopia, it says Kush. Okay, so they have um, changed it to Ethiopia, but it's actually not Ethiopia today. The land the area of Kush would probably include Ethiopia, but it's mostly the Sudan where we find uh, a mess, right? An Islamic uh, takeover going on there and major civil war and all kinds of problems over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, right? So a very unstable country which is aligned with uh, the Islamic Jihad crowd, right? And so, uh, happens to be right next to, uh, so Libya, uh, put seems to be a little bigger than Libya to include some of the other uh, countries there. But it's interesting that um, Libya is very unstable now also, and we see that Russia is actually recently, uh, on in July, has moved into Libya. They've establishing a base there. So, uh, just to show you the connection, right? Um, so, oh my gosh, this is one you haven't seen in a long time. So, oh, you remember the blood moons and all that? And everybody's like, ah, I see, I told you nothing happened. We had all that talk and books and everything. But of course, they don't learn, do they? Don't see anything. Don't notice what happened. So, we're going to go back and look at what happened real briefly here from 2014 and 15. Do you remember the blood moons? I remember seeing the last one. It was phenomenal. Um, but the significant thing about them is that they were on Passover and the Sukkoth and um, two years in a row. And that that hadn't happened since 67 and before that, 48, 49, and before that, 1914, 92. All the key years for Israel. And um, so they happened in 2014 and 15. And, you know, of course, the crazies were all saying Jesus is coming and all that. And the world's going to end and all that stuff. It had nothing to do with that at all. As we pointed out, it had to do with trouble coming for Israel. That's the point of the, moon, the blood moon. It's a sign that there's difficulty coming for the, for the Jews. And boy, did difficulty come. Uh, 2014, what we had was the Gaza War. Remember that? Broke out right after that. Um, and since then, there has been an incredible increase in terrorism and violence, not only in Israel, but around the world. But Israel has been in a state of war since then. 
Um, we look at the stabbings started, uh, 198 stabbings, 213 shootings, 68 vehicle attacks, so they attacked people with vehicles. All this started in 2014. Uh, constant, uh, the one vehicle bombing, 70 killed, uh, almost 1,100 wounded. Uh, would you consider that war? They're shooting missiles every other week into the country. So, yes, uh, we have a serious increase in, in stress and, and pain for the Jewish people since the blood moons. But it isn't over at all. And uh, look what's happening now. Um, oh, and you know about the rioting that goes on every, every Friday. 10,000 people on the border rioting, shooting balloons fire balloons and all kinds of bombs and everything and balloons over into, the, into Israel, which they have to deal with, fires and everything else. Um, m most people didn't notice this, but um, we have Magog and allies that are mentioned in Ezekiel 38 uh, and 39, now perched on the north of Israel in Syria. Uh, Russia moved in. Uh, here we see a picture. Uh, guess when Russia moved in? September the 30th, 2015, just right after the last blood moon. Uh, Magog moves. All the, the, the whole north that was mentioned in the prophecy moves, it's, uh, um, establishes itself in massive uh, deportation of, of uh, armament, equipment, and, and uh, military bases in uh, Syria, right in the north of Israel. I would say that's pretty big, okay? But the thing that goes with it is we have the same, the actual alliance that's mentioned in Ezekiel all together on this. Okay, what happened there? Um... Now, this is something, again, that you have to see it to really understand it. We see Iran, okay? Iran is over here in red. Iran uh, is Persia, right? And Iran, of course, is lined with Russia. Right now, they're like, you know, joined at the hip. How did that happen? Did you know that uh, Iran and both Iran and Russia used to be aligned with the West in the old days? Right? But all, everything has changed. And now we have the picture that uh, uh, we see in Ezekiel 38 and 39 developing before us. Uh, we see how Iran has been spreading its tentacles right throughout, now very strong in Iraq. Uh, as America's pulled out troops, they've moved in. We have seen now where they've established a way that they can go from right from Iran right into Syria, right to the north of Israel. And they have essentially great influence in Iraq and Syria. They can essentially do whatever they want. Um, because now um, the only forces opposing them are the U.S. and Israel, right? Um, so down in here in Yemen, a lot of, we don't hear much about Yemen, but that's a cauldron of, of war also. Great suffering going on down there as Iran has been uh, caused a coup down there, has been stoking a war down there for years, been brewing. And they're trying to essentially uh, do away with Israel, Saudi Arabia. They want to take over the whole Middle East. All right? You see that from that chart? So... And within the last couple of years, uh, this is actually 2018, major alliance between uh, uh, Iran, Russia, and Turkey. All the key players in the prophecy. Right? Isn't this amazing? Now, I don't think this is the gog magog battle. A lot of people think that's what's coming up, what we're, go what we're going to see. But I don't think that's it. And the reason is this. Um, let's look at some of the verses I put on here from Ezekiel 38 and 39. There are several things that 
uh, those passages say will happen that couldn't possibly happen, I believe, before the tribulation period. They would have to be during it. Okay? Uh, it says, after the battle, God will no longer allow his name to be profaned. And it's inconceivable that right after that, we'd have the great apostasy and the Antichrist appearing when the greatest profaning of God's name ever takes place. Right? So it would seem to me that that cannot happen, uh, that that's really the end of the tribulation period. So that this uh, battle that's spoken about um, in Ezekiel 38 and 39 takes place at the end of the tribulation. It's like towards the end of the tribulation. It's the great Armageddon struggle, right? When Christ comes and just destroys everybody. But it goes on for a couple of years. Are you there? Okay. Um, the other thing says the nations will know God's blessing on Israel after this battle. Again, that doesn't fit the scenario before the tribulation period. Uh, people of Israel, it says, will be living securely in peace and security. That's not going to happen until uh, the peace treaty is signed and all that. Right? Uh, it says there's a great earthquake in the land and everything shakes in God's presence, mountains thrown down. Again, that describes the tribulation period. Pestilence and blood, I will rain on him. Torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone, right? Uh, they're making firewood out of the weapons, so on. Um, and the great supper that, com uh, that compares of Ezekiel 39 says that God's going to have a great supper for all the birds and everything, from the flesh of all the people that are destroyed. And the same picture again in Revelation 19 is the picture of, of Armageddon and when Christ's coming. Have you got that picture of Jesus? Amen? That's not a, pip, uh, that's not a, a very popular picture of Jesus, is it? But that's what's coming. All right. So, what's the conclusion? My conclusion is that I don't believe that the war that's coming is that war. However, it, could, it is the same players. So it's very possible that what we're about to see is a war that's pretty intense in the Middle East. And we very well may be looking at a world war developing before our eyes. And you know that people are always clueless when these things come. They don't see it. They never see it. They're too busy. As always, they're going on with their lives, you know, getting married and so on, as the Scripture says, planting, doing business, and all the rest of it. And they don't, they're clueless until it all comes on them, right? Um, World War I, World War II, the same way. People just kind of ignore the news. They ignore what's happening, and they just, all of a sudden, they wake up one day, and they're at war. How did we get into this? You know, but we're not like that, right? We see it coming. Now, um, we want to point out something here. So we're looking at this chart here. Uh, we see that um, the, the nations mentioned in this prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and 39 are what we call the outer ring. See that? They're the outer ring. They're a little bit further away, although... Uh, Turkey's not that far away, but they're on the outer ring around Israel, right? What we want to point out is in the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's no mention of Gaza. There's no mention of Syria. No mention of Hezbollah, Lebanon. Hezbollah controls Lebanon. Not mentioned. The West Bank isn't mentioned. In fact, Jordan isn't even mentioned. Wow. Wow. So that implies that something has happened to change the current situation before that war comes, before the tribulation period comes. Are you with me? So if these, na these, are the, the, these are the players now that are, on, that are surrounding Israel to attack Israel, and they're not mentioned in this war. So uh, I believe the key players, that the big players that are in this war now are obviously Russia, um, Iran, Turkey, United States, all of the uh, France is over there, Britain is over there, 
I don't know if you know this, but all of the, arm, all of the armies have representation right in Syria and in the Mediterranean, have ships in the Mediterranean. And of course, we have ships all over the place there and troops in Iraq, in the, um, in the Gulf, okay, everywhere, Mediterranean. And so does Russia has a lot of, uh, has been building up and building up in the Mediterranean. Have you been noticing that? Now, wouldn't that suggest to you something is happening? Okay, so look at that. Um, how are we doing for time here? Oh, we're okay, right? We're not too bad. Uh, I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to skip this for the sake of time. But uh, in, in the... If this is Psalm, this is Psalm um, 83. A lot of people are saying that this war that's happening now is eight, Psalm 83. Psalm 83 mentions these places that we just spoke about. Um, Edom, Ishmaelites, Moab, and Hagrites, and it's uh, Gebel, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia. These are all, this is Gaza, this is Lebanon, this is um, Jordan. Okay? And, and some of the, the, um, the west would be the, some of the Sinai. You know, the whole area is what's mentioned in Psalm 83. And some think that's the war that's to come. I don't know if that's true. I wouldn't necessarily um, say that uh, Psalm 83 is a picture of that war. But those are the nations that are not mentioned in the other prophecy. So we can conclude that what is about to happen... Uh, is about those folks. Are you there? Syria situation. And of course, Iran, I suspect, Iran and Russia are in serious serious tension between them and the West right now. And it's very, very bad, very serious, right? And I think that they are going to, this war is going to happen. And those players from Ezekiel are going to go away after this war, but they're going to have to rebuild again. But later on, they'll come back again to settle the score in the tribulation. That's what I believe is going to happen. Are you there? Okay. Um, so, that's a picture from a Psalm 83. It mentions all those, those places around about. Syria, Lebanon, uh, Gaza, right? And Jordan. Now, Jordan is, is um, staying out of it right now, but Jordan is very wobbly. Jordan could, may, might not survive. We don't know. It's got a lot of radicals in Jordan. It wouldn't take much to push it over. A war starts. That's likely. Okay? Um, so, folks, there's a war coming. Isn't that uh, exciting news for the day? Well, no, of course we don't want to see war coming. But every time since God has uh, started this process of restoring Israel, every time they were at an impasse with the nations, uh, we had a major war. And that's how it was resolved. So there's a good chance that that's how it's going to get resolved again. Okay, Um, now look at some of the players that are in Syria right now. You see down up here where the Kurds are, we, we, we are, the United States is there. Uh, we see Russia has dug in its heels big time with um, Syria and on the east of, coast of Syria, right? Uh, having bases and all kinds of planes and, and equipment and, and uh, defensive equipment and offensive equipment and so on. Also, we see Turkey on the north here, right here. Turkey is down into Syria right now. So we have the U.S., we have Turkey, we have Russia, we have um, the U.S. down here as well. Then we have uh, Syria right here. We have Iran right here. Iran right here on the Golan uh, border, on the border with Israel. And of course, we have Israel, right? And then we have Hezbollah right here. And maybe you see there's a problem brewing. Now, um, it 
would be a miracle, in my opinion, if a war does not start here. And it could happen. And I'm not for war, just so I make myself clear. But I also know that sometimes war is the only way to move things forward. And God, of course, will use uh, whatever the, the countries do, God will work it out. You understand? And nobody stands in the way of God's purposes. Nobody. Especially when it comes to Israel. Nobody stands in the way. God's timing, it will get worked out. Now, uh, let me give you some of the reasons for war. They are enormous reasons. Number one, Israel versus its enemies. The hatred of Israel that they're spewing out every day and the attacks that are coming every day. Right? That in itself is a very creates a very strong likelihood there will be war. Um, second, we have Russia versus the West right now, which is at a, a very scary place. Very scary place. Uh, we have the Saudi Arabia versus Iran, which is another struggle that is looks like it's going for head-on war. On top of that, we have oil pipelines and routes and gas pipelines and money and the money cabal and we have sanctions and we have then we have the Ukraine issue Russia and the Ukraine so there are a lot of reasons for a war to break out don't you see that now um, look at let's look at some of the headlines here as we kind of wind this down let's look at some of the headlines Iran threatens to annihilate Israel this is almost every other day now right and then Hezbollah has hundreds of thousands of r missiles, and many of them more sophisticated ones because they've been up, they're updating, bringing in arms all the time now. And that's why Israel has to keep going in there and trying to blow things up because they are building up big time on the border. Uh, so there's no way that these pl the, that Hezbollah or Hamas or Syria, or I would say even Russia, can prevail here. Okay? No way. But they can do s significant damage. You have to understand Israel is such a small country that, you know, with 100,000, 150,000 missiles pointed at it, and then on the, on the south, on the north, to three, three places right now, uh, that they have to act, like, fast. They have to be ahead of the curve. So it's a scary situation. And it's become very clear that the United States right now has their back. Uh, I don't know if you've been watching that. The IDF uh, says that it has, there's been 200 Iranian targets in, hit in Syria in 2017. Did you know that? Then this incident happened. These now are in order. They're following um, the dates, OK? This one here um, was September the 18th, when the Russian plane was accidentally shot down. The, the Syrians trying to shoot at Israel shot down a Russian plane. They, they just don't do very well with those guns. So you can see how something will go astray and maybe hit the Temple Mount, you know? You just never know what's going to happen. You can see that scenario happening, right? Um, and again, I'm not saying I want that, but you see that that's very possible. Um, here we have Russia threatening Israel. After the plane was shot down, Russia threatened Israel and continues to threaten Israel now. Although one day they threaten you, then the next day oh, it's all nice again, then they threaten you. So you can't trust anything they say. It's what they do that you have to watch, right? Um, now, a serious development, this, is, uh, this was in October, October the 5th. Russia brings in all these sophisticated uh, air defense w weapons to, to uh, shoot down um, Israeli planes, giving them to Syria and so on, teaching them and giving them guys to, to run them. So, um, but they won't really be operational, we're told, until January. Um, then we have 
right after, we have, this is, that was, um, what was that, October the 5th? Then here, November the 18th, here comes the USS Truman carrier strike force uh, bound for the waters off Syria amid Russian naval buildup. But it's just another day in the Mediterranean, right? No. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, November the 20th, Beirut asks Russia to give them air defense. And, you know, they're run by terrorists, Hezbollah. So, you know, it would be obvious answer, no, we can't do that. But guess what? They didn't say no. They're still mulling it over. Because they never give up any chance. Uh, okay. Now, this, that was November 20th, right? Two days later, the U.S. Air Force takes control of the Syrian skies. Uh, there was some unidentified strike on an Iranian target. So look, they're from, from, um, from the Gulf here, right? Uh, the Persian Gulf, right through to the Mediterranean. Because we have ships there, we have ships here. And they flew the planes right across in a clear statement that, you know, you don't have control of the skies. And, of course, the Russians and the Syrians just kind of, you know, stood back. But that doesn't mean it's over by any means. Um, I suspect what will happen is what happened with other wars, the other major world wars, is somebody will... They will try to uh, get, suck them into it. They won't come out and just shoot, but they will try to get them to fire the first shot, right? And Sir, uh, Israel, of course, can't wait for that. They cannot wait for these nations to, uh, their enemies, to get, you know, in a position that could, you know, wipe them out. They're going to have to do something. And the U.S. knows that, of course, and they're all involved. And there's a whole lot more going on behind the scenes than any of us know, of course. We're just getting the, you know, the news after it's all happened. So, it gets worse every day. Another, uh, you know, now uh, Iran says Israel's a cancerous tumor. Well, they've been saying that for years, but now they're like saying it every day. Um, then we saw on, this was, I'm almost done here, I'm coming near the end. This was uh, November the 26th, a couple of days later, we see Russia ramming uh, uh, the Ukrainian vessels in the Crimea. The, the Ukraine was just going through the, go, going through the strait there, doing its thing, going to its own country, oil uh, barges and stuff, and they were rammed by the Russians, and they were, um, oh, sorry about that. They were rammed by the Russians, and they arrested the Ukrainian sailors, and they, as far as I know, they're still holding them. So uh, Ukraine uh, calls mar uh, installs mar uh, martial law, and they are preparing for war. That's just a few days ago. Uh, then this is a day later. Iran trains squads for terrorizing U.S. forces in Syria. U.S. air and naval buildup for striking back. How many of you know it's getting a little hotter? This is um, just this just happened Thursday. That Israel, uh, the largest ever surface missile attack on Syria, targeting 15 Iranian Hezbollah sites. That happened Thursday night. So, folks, it's not looking good. Uh, everybody, it, this, all of the secular folks are saying that we're we're just about for a world war. Not just the, uh, you know, the prophecy guys. The, these are the main head, main, mainline news is saying. It. So it's time to wake up and see it. Amen? But for us, we're watching Bible prophecy. For us, this is phenomenal development. And something we have been predicting for, I've been predicting for about three years. It's happening now. Okay, so we're done. We're going to finish off here now. Uh, talking about, you like that picture? That's nice, I like that. Uh, when we look at what man does, we can get discouraged, right? 
If we see all of this stuff happening, we become, can become very discouraged. But if we see what God is doing, we're not discouraged. We're excited because we know the kingdom of heaven is coming. The kingdom of God is coming. We know that Jesus is coming soon. We know that he's the only one that can bring peace to this planet. He's the only one who can restore righteousness. Amen? And the kingdom of Christ is coming soon. And that's the good news. And we know that there are three plans, right? We have man's plan, which he is working feverishly to bring about one world government. That's why I think the powers that be, we'll talk more about those later, uh, their the decision has been made. I think Russia and Iran have to be brought under, they have to be made to submit. I believe that decision has been made. Okay? I can't prove it, but we'll see. I believe the evidence is there that they have decided that they have to be dealt with. And of course, it's always first, it's always about money. Have you noticed? It's always about money. So both of those countries are now in the squeeze and have a serious financial problems. Serious to where they're... So that, again, is something that causes, you know, uh, people, to, causes them to lash out and start wars. Because that's how they do it when they're desperate. Right? But I think there's a, there's a, a trap being set here. But what we need to know is a man's plan... The devil's plan, we know, is to bring about the one world government also so he can be worshipped. So he's the real architect of the one world government. Right? But we know that God uses man's plan and the devil's plan to work out his plan. And so, uh, as we said in the beginning, uh, Ephesians 1.11, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. Amen? Amen. So, folks, hang on. Uh, fasten your seatbelts. Hang on. We're in for some very choppy waters. Um, I personally think that this could be the event that prepares the way for the building of the temple. It's, it's fascinating that we have this this deck, the blood moans, then we build up with all this, you know, the nations gathering, the ones in the prophecies gathering, and then we have the declaration about Jerusalem, and now we have war about to break out. Okay, so let's stand up. And let's uh, pray. Thank you, Lord. So let's just take a moment here. We're just going to, I'm just going to pray for Israel and for this whole situation. And then we'll just do the blessing, all right? So, Father, we just thank you. We, are, we thank you, Lord, not that there's trouble, not that people are suffering. We don't thank you for that, Lord. We know who's the cause of that, Lord. We know that that's man's fault. That's our sin. That's the sin of the world that's causing all these issues. But we know, Lord, that you are at work in all these things to bring about your purpose. We know that you judge, that you raise up leaders, that you take down leaders. We know that you raise up nations and that you lower nations and you take out nations. Amen. And we know, Lord, that in the midst of war, you work out your purposes. And so, Father, we pray right now for Israel that this situation, that you would use it to bring them back to you, to bring their hearts back to you to change the situation. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you would come soon. Lord, come soon. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would begin to open the eyes of the leaders, the church leaders out there that are deceiving people and telling them things are going to get better and telling them we're going to have revival and all this stuff is going to happen. That's not going to happen. So I pray that you would speak to them and and, 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 and do a work in the church, Lord, that you would raise up godly prophets, Lord, to speak your word and to declare what you're about to do in these days. And Father, would you give us souls? Would you give us souls, Lord, people who want you, Lord? We believe in the midst of all these things that you will bring souls into the kingdom. 
In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. Let his face shine on you. May he lift up his countenance on you and give you shalom. Amen.